Zaire starts administering the poison, and we get a nice close-up shot of Korra writhing in extreme agony, hallucinating, and... <laughs> Jesus! Arse! Holy Christ! preface this section with my opinion of season two. Season two was fine, but I think it was the most problematic season in the show, and that's because of three reasons. Reason one, it wasn't nuanced. In a minute, you'll hear Lily swear up and down that the Civil War arc was excellent writing, and the Avatar Origins arc was what messed it up. She's wrong. From the very beginning, this was not a nuanced Civil War story. There was a clear bad guy who was nothing but bad, and there was a clear good guy that was nothing but good. If Unalak had more depth than what he was given, it would have made for a far more engaging season. But because he didn't have much depth, Season 2 was unable to compete with the other seasons. Reason 2. It messes up the series' threat escalation. Each season's villain poses a certain degree of threat to the balance of the world. Let's discuss them from the least threatening to the most threatening. 1. Amon. He wants to take away bending from benders. Well, he's the only one who's capable of doing such a thing, so it's not like he's gonna get any progress done fast. He's a great villain, but he's not nearly as threatening as the other villains. It was good he was the villain of Season 1. 2. Zahir and the Red Lotus. They want to get rid of all hierarchy, including the Avatar. Okay, a lot more threatening than Amon. Amon's movement contained only one bender whereas the Red Lotus contains several skilled benders and a few significant political leaders, such as Unalak. 3. Kuvira and the Earth Empire. They want to stabilize the Earth Kingdom, but they're hostile to international regulation. They have a lot more threatening than Amon and his little posse of non-benders, as well as the underground Red Lotus. Kuvira is a skilled earth and metal bender on top of having immense political and military influence. She very well could have taken over more than the Earth Kingdom with the size of her military and her super weapon. 4. Unalak. He joined forces with the literal embodiment of darkness and chaos, and sought to create 10,000 years of darkness. Um, hello? Amon, the Red Lotus, and Kuvira combined ain't got nothing on these guys. Even if Zahir managed to establish absolute anarchy worldwide, or if Kuvira successfully conquered every known continent, the damage they do does not come close to 10,000 years of freaking darkness. So I think it was a mistake for Unalak and Vatu to be the villains of Season 2. They were more suited to being the villains of the final season because the stakes are the highest in Season 2. Reason 3. Korra's overarching character development arc is thrown out of order. Korra learning the true purpose of the Avatar should have been the last step of her Avatar journey. First, she should have struggled with comprehending her duty as the Avatar in the human world like how to maintain political harmony or discerning when she should remain neutral in international conflicts. Second, she should have struggled with detaching her individual identity and self-worth from her identity as the Avatar. Finally, after she's overcome those obstacles, then she should have learned about the origins of the Avatar 
and what her ultimate duty is. That way, the emotional subtext that span across the entire series has a climactic finish. Scathing as my criticisms of season two are, I can still appreciate it for what it was, because at its core, it's still not an awful season. Sure, its problems are glaring, but there was still enjoyment to be had in it. Not everyone else thinks the same. The season opens with the Chieftain of the Northern Water Tribe offering to teach Korra about the spirits, remarking on the fact that she's been sheltered from the Avatar journey throughout her entire life. From there, Unalak starts talking about the unification of the Water Tribes and a civil war breaks out between the North and the South, and Korra learns that her father was banished from the North for burning down a spirit forest and angering the spirits. Korra tries desperately to remain neutral until her father is imprisoned for inciting rebellion, and she learns that Unalak plotted all of this, including her father being banished years ago and the spiritual unrest going on in the Water Tribes was his fault the entire time. Korra ceases to be neutral and retreats to Republic City to find help, which connects to multiple different storylines. After the new president of Republic City refuses to send the United Forces, Asami agrees to sell weapons and mecha tanks to the South to save her company. But she's sabotaged by Varric, who wants to push future industries into a position to have to sell to him because he wants their assets to profit off the Civil War. Varric also starts pushing propaganda films to push Republic City into supporting open war starring Bolin and inciting terror attacks on Republic City to blame the North. Holy shit! Civil war that builds on material introduced in The Last Airbender, war propaganda, and a war profiteer all connected with each other, and we're only halfway through the season by this point. The amount of detail and complicated storytelling on display is amazing, and it's the first time that the show really grabs you by the nuts and never lets go, as even minor fights between main characters start carrying a lot of tension because you've seen what kind of domino effect it can have on the rest of the story. You even get old school plot divergences with tens and going on vacation with his family, who are still the best characters in the show. This is the kind of writing that the entire series needed so much more of, a densely packed and interconnected story that takes full advantage of the fact that the series is running on a continuous narrative and can keep throwing curveballs at you with new developments and playing off material we established a few episodes ago to guide said curveballs right into your groin. Well, that all sounds great, you might be saying. So what's the problem? Well, we still have another half of the season to go, that's what. After departing to seek help from the Fire Lord, Korra is ambushed by a dark spirit and washes up on the shores of the Fire Sages, where we're treated to the real reason the dark spirits are running rampant and Unal is hungry for power, and the origin of the Avatar. The Avatar is the result of a light spirit permanently fusing with a human in a constant state of reincarnation to endlessly do battle with a dark spirit who wants to burn all mortal life in the world every 10,000 years. And Unalak wants to release the dark spirit, and everything he's been doing has just been a means to an end. Because what this story about the chaotic interplay between the four elements built off Eastern mythology needed was God and Satan. Mm. I think we already discussed how this isn't the case. There are almost no parallels between the origins of the Avatar and Christianity. Someone could make the argument that the Avatar is similar to Jesus in that it is a mortal representative for God, but even that is a stretch. Ancient mythologies are filled with traditionally good gods and traditionally bad gods. So why aren't you assuming this isn't inspired by one of those stories instead of Christianity? And that's us assuming there's an inherent problem with using the basic Christian conflict as a template to begin with. Objectively good and evil, light versus dark proselytizing. That's the kind of nuanced attitude we need in this show. Why isn't one of you destroyed the other? He cannot destroy light any more than I can destroy darkness. One cannot exist without the other. Yeah, that sure ain't nuanced, eh? Not nuanced at all. No siree. Also, didn't the last airbender have an objectively good and evil dynamic between the hero and the villain? Scratch that. Countless stories have an objectively good and evil tone in its conflict. Why are you holding this show to a different standard? Anyway, as tension for Vatu starts to ramp up, the civil war falls by the wayside. We get maybe one battle between the Northern and Southern Water Tribe, and we wrap up that bit with Varric trying to escalate the war for the sake of profits, and then all our focus is put toward the conflict between Rava and Vatu. Immediately, Season 2 commits the cardinal sin of character-based storytelling. It starts treating its lore as this big important thing that needs to be fleshed out. I've talked about this before, but there's a severe dissonance between the values of good storytelling that make something memorable and interesting, and what hardcore fans think makes a story memorable and interesting. And detailed lore is very much in the latter category. Hello, my kinfolk! The 
god of what makes good storytelling is a lily orchard. Oh, fanbase, hold as thy tongue, for Lady Lily knoweth truly what a good story maketh. Ceases thine incessant whining for lore, and falter at the feet of she who knoweth what is best. So, Lily, you think hardcore Legend of Korra fans think detailed lore is what makes for a good story? Sweetie, no. Character-based storytelling is the very thing that breeds hardcore fans. Oh, but don't you worry. I brought facts to the table. Your admiral went the extra mile and held a poll on r slash the legend of Korra and r slash the last airbender on reddit. The question was, what made the legend of Korra interesting? Let's look at the results, shall we? 37% said the characters, 23% said the political themes, 14% said the world, 13% said the lore, and 12% said the story. Granted, this poll didn't get to nearly as many people as I would have liked but the ratios are precisely what I predicted. And really, that's because I didn't even need to take a survey to know this. It's common knowledge that fanbases love the characters of whatever series is in question. It's what they talk about, what they draw, what they write. Your attempt to paint fanbases as wanting more lore instead of character development is contrived and inherently uncharitable, and I can see right through it. All this crap about the Avatar spirit and Avatar Wan and harmonic convergence and Vatu being imprisoned for another 10,000 years so he doesn't blanket the world in darkness is all needless bullshit. Avatar establishes a unique and culture-rich world. Lily. Korra expands upon that unique world. Lily. Worse even, this unnecessary exposition dump does three things to ruin the story. One, it undermines the Civil War. Civil Wars are great conflicts because there's no objectively good or evil side in them if you write them properly. You can have each side be as well-intentioned or petty as you like and force the viewer to engage with the story and pick a side. You remember Captain America's Civil War, where the two sides are fighting over whether the Avengers should have complete autonomy or submit to the United Nations? You know how you can tell that was a very well-written film? Because it's possible for viewers to be Team Cap or Team Iron Man. Each side makes enough good points and had enough valuable ground that it was possible to break the base. And breaking the base is what Civil War stories are supposed to do. If you don't have fans arguing about which side was truly in the right, you fucked up. Season 2 of Korra starts doing this with Unalak talking about how he wants to bring back the Water Tribe spirituality that was lost in the last few centuries. We see inklings of that throughout the world. The Legend of Korra takes place in a much less spiritual time, with even the very spiritual Tenzin struggling to enter the spirit world. We can see how brash and bullheaded Tanrock is. The only way Unalak was even able to trick him into being banished was because he knew his brother had zero respect for the spirits and would trash that forest. That was still his own fault. He should have known better. We could have had the kind of new nuanced and thought-provoking story the writers clearly wanted to make, but they just couldn't restrain themselves. While the civil war between the northern and southern water tribe was interesting, it's not nearly as nuanced or messy as you think. As a matter of fact, it's probably about as nuanced as the American Civil War, and by that, I mean almost black and white with only a few gray areas. I'd go so far as to say Civil War is a misnomer in this instance. What happened was more like a coup d'etat. From the beginning, Unalak's motives were malicious, even before we knew about Rava and Vatu. You don't want unity. You want power. You've always been jealous of my father, haven't you? You got him banished so you could become chief, and I bet it just killed you to learn he was the Avatar's father. No wonder you kept trying to take me away from him. And the way he goes about gaining control over the Southern Water Tribe is beyond sympathetic. He purposely put his own brother in a position that would get him banished from the Northern Water Tribe. He brought a good bulk of his military over from the North, which was an obvious preemptive sign of aggression. And he predetermined his brother's trial and punishment by putting a corrupt judge on the stand. And in the midst of this, Tonrock is victimized entirely, guilty only of being a poor spiritual leader, which is an earnest flaw in his character that can be easily fixed if he were given counsel by the right people. The overall lack of nuance in Season 2 was one of my heaviest criticisms of the season. The ingredients were there to make a Civil War story that was as thought-provoking as you thought it was, but unfortunately, that route was not taken. Unalak was a morally black villain from the get-go, so the Avatar Origins arc did not ruin this supposed nuance Season 2 had. It never had it in the first place. 2. It explains the magic. 
don't explain the magic. Just don't fucking do that. We all saw this, right? It's an alright movie that's extremely overhated, but this scene is really dumb and unnecessary. Honestly, were there a lot of people out there at the end of Avatar begging to know the origins of the Avatar cycle and where the Lion Turtles came from? The Lion Turtles' origins were never explained in The Legend of Korra. Just thought I'd mention that. Actually, there probably was, and the writers listened to them. And now season two is the most hated season among the fanbase because of fucking course it is. Fans always say they want the magic to be explained and they want all this lore and backstory for everything, but fans don't have a fucking clue what they want, especially when they totally misunderstand the values of the things they consume that they think explaining the Avatar cycle was something that needed to happen. <laughs> The high and mighty Lily hath spoken. Thou wishest to know of the Avatar's origins. Oh no, 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 feeble peasant. Thou knowest not what is most good for thee. For the record, I've never seen any forum or fan discussion where people were just itching to know the origins of the Avatar. Regardless, it was still a nice thing to know. It was fun to learn where the Avatar came from, who the first Avatar was, how it has the ability to bend the four elements, and what its ultimate purpose is. And contrary to what you've been saying, the show does this without explaining the magic. We still don't know the method behind bending the elements. How does one manage to control fire by flinging their hands and feet around? Do they have to do intense calculations in their head like espers in a certain scientific railgun? Do they have to envision the atoms moving around? Do they have to think of the element as an extension of themselves? Or do they even have to think about it at all? Is there a scientific explanation for bending? Or is it strictly spiritual? And see, there are still many questions about the magic that have yet to be answered. If the Avatar vs. lore was going to be explained to any further extent, expounding upon the background of the Avatar was paramount, especially since the biggest theme of The Legend of Korra is identity. Three, it turns the story into a fucking fanfic. If there were a list of things you should never do when writing a story about the Avatar, the words Dark Avatar would be right at the top of that list, bold-faced, underlined, circled with red ink, with arrows pointing to it, reading, DON'T FUCKING DO THIS! Coincidentally, right underneath it would be Dragon Ball Z Hadouken lasers. Tell me why, tell me why, tell me why, tell me why. Season 2 of Legend of Korra does both of these things, and while some people may find these trite and lazy methods of increasing tension and pretending a fight scene is more intense than it really is, this was the point where most of Korra's fanbase were immediately turned right the fuck off from the season. Coincidentally, it also points to just how fanfic in nature the writing is. Fanfics emulate Dragon Ball Z in their stories because it's the only way they understand to increase tension, while properly introduced works increase tension by working on the relationships between all the characters involved. What? What are you talking about? Fanfiction, by and large, does not use Dragon Ball Z methods to increase tension. Regardless of how well-written they are, countless stories do increase tension by detailing the character relationships. That's because, at its core, fanfiction thrives on characters, not settings or lore or themes. Why else is alternate universe fanfiction so popular? Alternate universe strips the series of everything except its characters, then explores the dynamics of those pre-established characters in a new setting. I should know because I read and write fanfiction! No need to worry, shipmates. I'll do the work for you and throw myself overboard in a minute. But all that work that has been built up over the season was abandoned the moment Korra discovers Unalak lied to her and joins the Kill Unalak party. Built up throughout the season? Korra becomes wary of Unalak's motives as early as Episode 3, and she fully takes the reins of the Kill Unalak party in Episode 4. And that's just how long it took Korra to recognize that Unalak was up to no good. The audience is supposed to figure that out sooner. This feeds into the larger season-wide problem of all the goodwill of the story being abandoned the moment Rava and Vatu were introduced because it turns a messy civil war into a battle against God and Satan. It wasn't a messy civil war. It was never headed toward being a messy civil war. And Korra was never written with that idea in mind. Maybe not the other seasons, but this one certainly was. 
it was written from a Knights of the Old Republic 2 perspective, where things are messy and you learn that the reason the Sith continue to exist despite being constantly wiped out is because people are always becoming disillusioned with the Republic and the Jedi. But where Korra differs from KOTOR 2 is that it keeps contriving reasons for its antagonists to still have to die because killing a villain is the only way we know how to make things feel climactic. Uh-oh, is that another lie from Lily? Color me shocked. Okay guys, you ready? You ready for another bombshell? You ready? Alright, here we go. Unalak is the only main villain Korra kills. Amon dies at the hand of his brother's murder-suicide. This occurred during the falling action of Season 1's plot diagram, not the climax. Zahir and Kuvira, on the other hand, get thrown into prison after their defeat. So neither the story nor its writers believe having Korra kill her enemies makes things climactic. This only happens once, and it just so happens to be with the villain that posed the biggest threat in the entire series. So we leave Season 2 with Unalak trying to destroy the world after releasing Vatu, but Korra concluding that maybe he was right in opening the spirit portals anyway, concluding that Avatar 1 made a mistake closing them despite having a very good reason for closing them in the first place. Juan did have a good reason for closing the portals, to keep everyone away from Vatu, who was bound in the Tree of Time. But guess what? Vatu ain't there no more, so there's no use in keeping them closed now, don't you think? The reason I compare this to fanfiction is because this tangled mess of contradictory ideas, themes, and execution is something you expect from fanfiction precisely because the people who write it are often novices, and these mistakes are to be expected and eventually be ironed out. There were no contradictory themes or ideas in Season 2. The Civil War was not as nuanced as you make it out to be. The moment we see Unalak's military docking at the end of Episode 2, it became crystal clear which side the viewers were supposed to be on. That's why I almost don't consider this conflict a civil war. It was Korra attempting to stop a violent takeover of her homeland. A violent takeover at the hands of someone with ulterior motives. They even bring up the same issues with Korra's upbringing and training, and how she's suffered from such a sheltered life and held back from the Avatar's journey, but they abandon it with everything else once it's time to start shoving in the lore and explaining the magic. So are we just going to forget about the entire struggle with getting Korra into the spirit world? You know, the most basic thing she needs to do in order to stop Vatu in the first place? This wouldn't have been a problem if Korra weren't raised the way she was, so the consequences of her upbringing do continue to be explored. Some of you may have gotten the impression that I was being a little more passive-aggressive than usual in this segment. I wouldn't say you're wrong, but please understand that your Admiral isn't trying to be mean to Lily. I'm being stern, because she goes on to say stuff like this. Good post. Lily, good post. However, most of the posts I see about Korra say that the Avatar 1 2 episodes are the only good episodes. So most of the fanbase likes them a lot. I made the mistake of assuming the audience had standards. I feel like the only good episodes in The Legend of Korra are the two about the first Avatar. And here we see the biggest of Legend of Korra's problems in action. The fanbase has warped ideas about what makes a good story. Just because you dislike the show, doesn't mean it automatically sucks. Talking about trying to push your opinion to others no one forced you to rewatch it. You did that yourself. Legend of Korra was amazing. My opinion. I'm not going to try to convince you it is amazing. Just my opinion. Get a life. Damn. Looks like you're really mad that your shitty show was called shitty. Maybe you should just get better taste. Or any taste. Stop eating garbage and then getting mad when someone points out that you're eating garbage. Which makes it all the more rich when she goes on to say stuff like this. More like, my opinion on the legend of Korra is garbage and here's why. Putting, my opinion, in a title is extremely condescending to the audience. Jeez Louise. And I thought the stuff in the video sounded condescending. Lily seems to have this attitude that her opinion is fact, and she is outrageously disrespectful to people who disagree with her. I have no problem with respecting Lily's opinion on this show, but her refusal to return the sentiment is... Well, it's childish. Your Admiral likes to abide by a policy. I treat others the way they treat me. Well, I like this show, so according to Lily, I have no standards, I don't know what makes a good story, and I don't have taste. I think I have a right to be snarky with her when we're discussing this subject.
Look over there, right there. There's a tiger. That tiger weighs 800 pounds and it can kill a man in 10 seconds. I'm gonna touch it. Hi, <laughs> tiger! Oh, he's angry! He's, uh, he's angry! show relies so heavily on its villains to drive the plot, we might as well move on to the most infamous of the bunch, the Red Lotus. Zaire is introduced as one of the non-benders gifted with airbending as a result of Korra doing the hibbjibbjibbjib -bij with the spirit portals. Unlike the other new airbenders we see, Zaire demonstrates an innate mastery with airbending the moment he's able to apply it. Zaire was a master martial artist when he was captured 13 years before the events of the series. He had to be locked away in a secluded prison and treated with extreme caution. Despite being a non-bender, he is given the same level of imprisonment as his comrades, who are benders. This dude was dangerous, even when he didn't have airbending as part of his arsenal. Since bending is an extension of one's fighting prowess, one's mastery of bending comes down to their mastery of the martial arts. So of course Zaire made for an adept airbender. He was just as dangerous as a bender beforehand. To add to this, Zahir speaks at length about the poet and airbending master Guru Lahima, the first airbender to learn how to fly. Have you ever read the poetry of the great airbending Guru Lahima? What? Guru Lahima lived 4,000 years ago in the Northern Air Temple. It is said that he unlocked the secret of weightlessness and became untethered from the earth, living his final 40 years without ever touching the ground. What were you reading? A poem by Guru Lahima, the wisest airbender who ever lived. Do you know who once said, new growth cannot exist without first the destruction of the old? No. The wise Guru Lahima, an airbender. He admired Lahima so much to the point where he memorized one of his poems, which he can still recite verbatim, even after spending 13 years detached from the world. Lahima once wrote, Instinct is a lie, told by a fearful body, hoping to be wrong. What's that supposed to mean? It means that when you base your expectations only on what you see, you blind yourself to the possibilities of a new reality. This guy ain't just some Joe Schmo. He's an exceptionally skilled martial artist who was educated on the air nomads and their culture. These aspects of Zahir's character make it believable for him to be a skilled airbender just by having little experience as a bender. We see snippets of Zaire freeing a number of other extremely powerful benders, but for the first quarter of the season, we're focused on Korra and the gang zooming around the Earth Kingdom looking for other airbenders. This brings them to Ba Sing Se, where it becomes clear to everyone that the Earth Queen has become an exceedingly powerful tyrant, more concerned with preserving her own opulence than actually governing her people, and has even kidnapped the airbenders in Ba Sing Se to conscript into her army. At the same time, we also learn that Zaire and his three buddies had tried to kidnap Korra when she was just a little baboo, and this is apparently supposed to serve as a justification for the white Lotus training her within the compound her entire life. Then the season waffles for several episodes as we deal with Su Yin and Lin, who we'll get to later, the new generation of airbenders, and then we finally get back to the plot when the Red Lotus plots to kidnap Korra a second time from Zaofu. This leads to what is probably the best actual fight scene in the entire series. As the main characters are pitched against absurdly powerful benders, they're forced to fight a lot smarter using metal bending to create cover, exploiting Bolin's honed accuracy to stun that one combustion bender, roping Zaire's staff and later slicing his glider, using firebending to evaporate water tendrils and taking advantage of tiny openings to completely destroy their plans. It's one of the most brilliantly written fight scenes in the entire series. It's right up there with Toph fighting in the earthbending rings. Finally, something we can agree on. God, I love this season. Later, every guard is questioned regarding how the Red Lotus even infiltrated Zaofu using a Truth Seer to determine who's lying. And it's glaringly obvious that the Truth Seer himself is the one responsible. And the show lingers on it just long enough for you to wonder if the writers are really gonna pretend that this is some kind of great secret. Thankfully, they don't. Anyway, they eventually track Zaire down to the spirit world where he explains to Korra that he's part of a society who wants to rid the world of governments in the name of true freedom. That's right. Season 3's big bad and resident philosophy is anarchism. Out of all the terrible philosophical ideas ever concocted, they opted for the very fucking worst. The bottom of the fucking barrel. I'm not an anarchist, but it's a little frustrating to hear you talk so authoritatively about politics. 
to hear you talk like you know whose political convictions are worth taking seriously and whose aren't. Like it or not, anarchism is a legitimate political philosophy and practice that is worthy of consideration, and it's discussed by more than edgy teenagers on 4chan. It's a school of thought whose origins have been traced back to ancient Greece and China, and has continued to be discussed in academia for centuries. I'm also here wondering why you sound so angry that anarchism is being discussed in Season 3. There are a lot of people who advocate for varying degrees of anarchist policies and anarchist-leaning governments. Hell, there are actually all sorts of different types of anarchism. Anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-syndicalism, anarcho-socialism, anarcho-communism, just to name a few. Zahir's brand of anarchism is the most extreme, absolute anarchism, a system in which all forms of hierarchy are dismantled. Some of the policies forwarded by these branches of anarchism are policies I actually agree with despite, once again, not being an anarchist myself. So it was a good idea to explore the extreme side of this complex ideology. What's funny is that this is the only time The Legend of Korra ever actually demonstrates the failings of the philosophy it's trying to cover. You're missing one. The Legend of Korra also demonstrates the repercussions of fascistic populism, as demonstrated by Kuvira, who we'll discuss in an upcoming segment. While the goals that Amon and Unalak pretend to have eventually become achieved, why are you using the word pretend, at least in Amon's case? Amon earnestly believed in equality. His zeal for equality was just taken too far. And even then, his goals are not exactly achieved. Republic City saw a reformed government that aimed to give more representation for non-benders, but benders themselves still got to keep their bending and presumably continue to hold more social power. Actually, all his work was reversed when Korra restored his victim's bending. Zaire flat out admits that Unalak becoming a dark avatar, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Unalak was working for the Red Lotus way back when, was not part of their plan, and later in Season 4, Zaire admits that he'd never expected Kuvira to achieve as much power as she had. This is because anarchism is a power vacuum. A period of anarchy will always result in new infrastructure taking its place. Whether it be city-states, authoritarianism, or communism, something will always fill that void. Not necessarily. To summarize how anarchists have explained it, as the way the world is now, Zahir's form of anarchism, absolute anarchism, would not work. If some sort of catastrophic event were to occur, and all the world's governments were destabilized or destroyed outright, the power vacuum would be seized by a new face of power. But this isn't because of magic or human nature or the order of the universe. It's because of people who believe in authority as a concept people who believe there must always be a leader. Anarchist advocacy is not just a struggle to overthrow oppressive systems. It's also a struggle to undermine the very mindset that allowed those systems to exist to begin with. This ideology is so revolutionary, it seeks to alter the very way we as a species perceive fundamental social dynamics. This is a reality that many real-world anarchists don't think about because most anarchists are idiot teenagers or libertarians whose entire thought process is, let's get rid of all the governments because governments are bad, and never think about the long-term effects of that decision. Nope. You have a painfully childish misunderstanding of the core principles of anarchism. Here's anarchist YouTuber ThoughtSlime to clean up the mess you just made. To put it simply, an anarchist is someone who doesn't believe that anyone should have power over anyone else for any reason unless it absolutely cannot be avoided. All authority is considered illegitimate by default and must prove itself to be both necessary and beneficial or be dismantled and replaced with a more egalitarian system. You may have heard that anarchists are people that oppose the government but don't really have any set political beliefs. That's a purposeful misdirection by authority figures who want to distance anarchist practice from anarchist philosophy to make us look like mindless edgelords. And you know what? It worked. While it's true that by definition anarchists must oppose the state, we don't just oppose the state. We oppose all forms of domination and hierarchy. That's the definition that has a centuries-old tradition attached to it. And this is going to be extremely important in just a moment. The Red Lotus traveled to Ba Sing Se, and after failing to negotiate the Avatar's capture with the Earth Queen, Zaire attacks, and for a lot of people, this was some kind of crowning moment of badass for Zaire. Oh my god, airbending murder! For me, I have to sit here while this grown-ass man-child repeats the mistakes of the Iraq War by plunging the Earth Kingdom into chaos as the people start rampaging across the nation, looting places and devolving to Fallout-style raiders and bandits. 
The Iraq War looked nothing like this. The Iraq War was started when the United States overthrew President Saddam Hussein and his government, subsequently seizing the power. The United States justified this unprovoked military attack by stating they believed Hussein's government was developing nuclear weapons. George W. Bush also lumped the war effort into his War on Terrorism campaign that followed the September 11 Twin Tower attacks. Of course, that's the generally accepted reason for the United States invasion. It is also believed that large oil companies, having lobbied, funded, and bribed various politicians, orchestrated the invasion to install a puppet government, which would allow them to gain access to Iraq's oil supply. The suppression of a nuclear weapons program was just a false pretense used to pacify the masses. Whichever reason is the case, the overthrowing of a political leader is the only aspect these two events share in common. The motivations between the United States and Zahir are polar opposites of each other. The United States sought to usurp Iraq's government, whereas Zahir wanted to abolish the Earth Kingdom's government altogether. Equating them in this situation was not a good idea, as it reflects a poor understanding of both situations on your end. Unlike Zahir, the United States anticipated and filled the subsequent power vacuum that followed the overthrowing of Hussein. This was completely intentional. Not a mistake as you put it. The subsequent chaos did not come from a state of lawless anarchy. It came from the insurgency that arose and directed its hostility toward the United States and its occupation. Looting, as usual, was a natural consequence that came with the confusion and chaos. One thing I find absolutely fucking hilarious is that Zaire declares that no longer will they be oppressed by tyrants, but in the very next season they start being oppressed by a brand new tyrant because of course they were. This is how anarchism always turns out. Why are you mad about this? Are you mad Zaire was proven wrong? What did you want to happen? Did you want the Earth Kingdom to suddenly turn into paradise after the Earth Queen was killed? Zahir and the Red Lotus are the antagonists precisely because their goals brought about bad outcomes. If they weren't wrong, they wouldn't be the bad guys, would they? The narrative even acknowledges this in this scene. True freedom can only be achieved when oppressive governments are torn down. But that won't bring balance. It will throw the world into chaos. Anyway, Zaire arrives at the Air Temple and holds the Airbenders hostage. After telling Tenzin of his plans, Tenzin immediately attacks Zaire and tells the Airbenders to evacuate while he, Kaya, and Bumi fend off the Red Lotus. And here's where that second heart-wrenching moment occurs. Tenzin has been one of the best characters in the series up to this point. You see him struggling to teach and increasingly unwilling to learn Korra. You see him raising his children, seeing the rebirth of the Air Nation. He gets more valuable characterization than any of the actual main characters in the series. Seeing him so thoroughly brutal is horrible. So horrible that the camera pans away so that you don't have to see the worst of it. This is especially troubling because the series has an almost fetishistic love of brutalizing Korra and showing you every gory detail. I felt genuine chills as the camera panned behind the air temple wall because so far Tenzin has been the only character I actually liked, and that made seeing him get beaten all the more horrifying. And like the scene with Zuko shows you what kind of show this could have been if the writers had put in this much effort everywhere. Korra arrives at the air temple and turns her in as the rest of the crew plots a flanking strategy. This leads into yet another very long battle, and so soon after the last one, the bending fights are starting to grow very tiresome. I'm not gonna talk about it yet. Long story short, the firebender dies a grisly death, Bolin discovers he can lava bend, we're all supposed to apparently be shocked that Zaire demonstrates his legendary bending technique, despite us seeing this technique used by the Sky Bison in every episode since the last airbender. It was impressive because Zaire isn't a Sky Bison. It turns out that Zaire intends to poison Korra into entering the Avatar state in order to kill her permanently, and then launches into a speech about freedom that sounds like it was ripped directly out of a Metal Gear cutscene. In fact, considering that Metal Gear Rising came out a year and a half before this particular episode aired, I wouldn't be surprised if they did just rip most of Zaire's bullshit from Senator Armstrong. Okay. So all we got here is speculation. Could you show us a scene from Metal Gear Rising where Senator Armstrong has a similar monologue? Well... Even if you did, there's no way to tell if the writer's intent was to copy Metal Gear Rising. Zahir isn't the first fictional character to express these kinds of anarchist sentiments. And again, how does you making a loose parallel to a Japanese video game make this show garbage? Or was this even supposed to be a point against the show? Why did you bring this up? 
Zaire starts administering the poison and we get a nice close-up shot of Korra arriving in extreme agony, hallucinating and- Let's go. Jesus, arse holy Christ. Here's a quick aside I thought was interesting. This particular shot is yet another element found in anime, in psychological thriller anime. It's not uncommon for the camera to get up and close to a character's face while they're experiencing immense physical or psychological distress. The wide-angle lens and contorted facial expressions are meant to make the viewer feel just as uncomfortable as the character. It's an interesting visual technique that forces the audience into the moment. I've avoided talking about it up until now, but I think this is the opportune time. This show has a really unhealthy fascination with brutalizing Korra and showing you every detail of her squealing in agony. While other characters are given the opportunity to take their beatings with dignity, Korra does not get anywhere close to that kind of dignity, and the writer seemed keen to show you every possible moment of her torture at every possible opportunity. I don't like to assume extremely horrible things about people unless they give me adequate reason to, but I can come up with no other reason for why this happens so frequently and in such gory detail to Korra and only to Korra other than the writers are getting off on it. Let's watch this scene in full. It's working. I told you, Korra. The world doesn't need you anymore. The time of the Avatar is over, Korra. Give up. <laughs> You're too weak to resist, and I'm stronger than ever. There's no use fighting. Let go. Let, Let go. go. Let, Let go. go. Let go. This was Korra's breaking point. Korra starts the series as proud, arrogant. She doesn't identify herself as just Korra. She's Avatar Korra. But every villain up until this point has bombarded her with accusations that the Avatar is no longer needed. In this moment, when the Avatar line is about to meet its end, Korra realizes they may be right. The enemies of her past haunt her. They reiterate what she fears most. The thing she's built her entire identity, therefore herself, on is not worth keeping alive. The Avatar is almost literally a god among humans, and showing her get beaten like this reminds the audience of just how human she actually is. Hell, it's not just a reminder for us, it's a reminder for Korra herself. The subsequent fight with Zahir reveals that she is not the almighty avatar she's hyped herself up to be. Even when she was in the avatar state, when she was supposed to be at the top of her game, Zahir wins. If Janora and the Air Nomads had not interfered, the avatar cycle would have been over. In Season 4, Korra doesn't see hallucinations of Zahir, she sees hallucinations of herself. A constant reminder that, even when she was supposedly at her strongest, she still wasn't strong enough. A reminder of her inadequacy. A reminder of her failure to live up to who she thought she was. She cuts off all ties with her friends and family. She cuts her hair to hide her identity. She's no longer Avatar Korra. She doesn't know who she is anymore. Yeah, you, you kind of look like that Avatar girl. I get that a lot. Whatever happened to her anyway? I wouldn't know. The narrative depicted this dark, gritty turn of events with no restraint, and for good reason. If her experience had been off-screen like Tenzin's beating, the emotional impact the audience is supposed to feel alongside Korra would have been hindered, if not eliminated outright. And, as I stated earlier, unfiltered depictions of strife is yet another element that anime is known to make use of. Now then, this final turning point in her character came off as fetishistic to you? That didn't even cross my mind during my initial watch of the series. You're weird. So after the writers are done cleaning up, Korra finally enters the Avatar state and rips herself free and starts chasing Zaire across the mountainside for about a minute before falling over again. What did you expect? The amount of mercury she had pumped into her was enough to kill an elephant. Zaire starts to suffocate Korra, and then Janora and then Zaire is finally defeated. After Suyin saves Korra, Zaire starts yelling desperately about how chaos is the natural order, and Bolin treats him the way you should treat all anarchists by shoving something in his idiot mouth so he finally shuts the fuck up. 
No, no, people. Ignore the fact that anarchism has been a widely discussed philosophy within the halls of academia. Ignore anarchist thinkers to the likes of Chomsky, Proudhon, Spooner, and Tolstoy. This random YouTuber knows everything about politics, so pack your bags. Fuck me, was this whole ordeal horrible. My guess is that the writers seriously couldn't think about how to raise the stakes any higher after pulling the Satan card, and the only reason they even chose anarchism as their philosophy of the day was because its inherent destructive nature made for a lot of massive set pieces. It makes sense considering that Zaire is such an overwhelmingly powerful airbender after only having airbending for a few weeks. I already explained why it's believable for Zaire to be a skilled airbender and why the bending fights are so common and drag on for so long that the sounds of fire and air start to bleed together. All right. I'm going to say it now. In section three of your video, you were complaining about how bending was set aside so they can wank off shitty 1920s technology some more. But now you're complaining there are too many bending fights? Consistency, damn it! I need consistency. Why the Air Nation suddenly experiences a boom of new airbenders. Why combustion bending makes a return to pepper episodes with literal base explosions. That's actually what it feels like. It feels like Michael Bay explosions the series. It feels like Michael Bay explosions the series. Okay, real talk. Are you seriously angry about the fact that this lady combustion bends? Weren't you just gushing about the fight in Zalfu? The lethality of police combustion bending was what forced the characters to approach fights with this kind of strategy and creativity. The character moments are so barren and empty compared to every other season, which is saying a lot. To each their own. If you honestly didn't believe the character interactions were interesting, I guess that's your opinion. But I can't even begin to understand why or how you'd feel that way, because I think Season 3 was when the character interactions were at their best. Given the fact that Season 3 is generally accepted as the series' best season, I'm clearly not the only one who thinks that. Every little detail, whether it's Korra playing fetch with Naga, <laughs> 
Lynn acting grumpy toward Naga. I think she wants you to throw it for her. I'll pass, thanks. Lin and Su Yin bickering. Hey everyone, my little sister is an expert on world affairs now. You want to talk about what's really bugging you because I'm right here. Bo Lin and Asami playing Pai Shou. The origins of Pai Shou date back over 10,000 years. It is a game of both strategy and chance. Wait, how can it be both? Let me see that. There have been countless variations of Pai Shou through the centuries, and each culture has its own rules and variations on the game. That's no help at all. Cora, as the avatar, you need to standardize these Pai Shou rules. Okay, I'll put that on my to-do list right after bringing back the Air Nation and taking down the group that tried to kidnap me. That's cool, whenever you get to it. Bo Lin trying to make friends with Ning Kuo and Gazan. You were raised by an older sister. Your mustache grew in when you were 10, and I'm sensing, just sensing, an unspoken attraction between you two. Two out of three, it's not bad. Bo Lin, will you stop making friends with the bad guys? Sorry. Korra and Asami working together in various situations. Kai outsmarting Mako and Bo Lin and Ba Sing Se. Excuse me. Pardon me. No, no, carry on. Uh, what are you doing running around robbing people? I was just practicing my airbending. Yeah, right. Let's go. You're in big trouble. Your little brother, huh? Yeah, just a lovable little scamp, isn't he? Reminds me of my little brother. Janora being given her master tattoos. It just oozes with personality and charm. Again, if it's your honest to god opinion that this season had weak character interactions, so be it. But with how much exaggeration has plagued this section in your video as a whole, it honestly sounds like you're just spouting whatever bad accusation you can think of. This is compounded with the fact that you made this complaint with nothing besides a sentence. No examples to illustrate your complaint. No suggestions of improvement. And it doesn't have the saving grace that Season 2 had of an actually interesting plot during the first half. I guess watching the characters venture across the vast Earth Kingdom while trying to avoid a shadowy underground organization wasn't interesting. There's a lot of pretend philosophy, more so than season 1 and 2, because the villain doesn't turn out to be a liar partway through, he's just really that stupid. But it's more than just the jingling keys nature of how the villains are portrayed, all sorts of interesting story ideas appear and vanish like clockwork. We're introduced to Lin's sister Su Yin, who shirks authority and commits crime in her youth and spends most of her life consequence free. This attitude carries over into her adult life, where she puts her utmost faith in people with some of the most horrid records, and talks about established government like it's some kind of poison. There's one scene where she's provoked into a rant about how outdated the concept of a queen is after hearing about Hu Ting's bullshit, and I suppose it's lucky the Fire Lord wasn't around to hear that. But after this brief stint of anti-royal sentiment, she's right there in the next season itching for Prince Wu to retake the throne of the Earth Kingdom. I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that she has a personal grudge against Kuvira, who led a mass defection from Zhao Fu. Kuvira turned my own son against me, and together they plotted behind my back. Kuvira and Batar left that day with Varric, my security force, and a few of Zalfu's wealthiest citizens. It's also worth mentioning that Su Yen was purposefully written to be hypocritical in nature. This isn't the only instance Su Yen has showcased blatant hypocrisy. How's your search for the new airbenders going? Honestly, not great. We had to rescue a whole group of them from the Earth Queen. Oh, she's horrible. She thinks she can just do whatever she wants. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Allow me to introduce the matriarch of the Metal Clan, Su Yin. And later... I mean, the idea of even having a queen is so outdated. Don't you agree, Korra? I... I haven't really thought about it too much. What? You let Korra go? I thought we were on the same page about this. And then you go stab me in the back? Oh, don't be so overdramatic. You can't control the Avatar's every move. And later... Ah! 
first date. Do it! Let's look at how she treats her son and how she treats Kuvira at the end of season 4. Keep in mind that both were equally guilty of the destruction caused by the Earth Empire. Mom, I'm so sorry. I betrayed you. Wing and Wei will never forgive me. And Opal. Yeah, they might take some time to come around, but we'll work through it. As a family. And later... And Sue, I'm sorry for all the anguish I've caused you and your family. You're going to answer for everything you've done. Su Yen prides herself on believing in second chances, but she only offers redemption to Batar Jr. and not Ku Vira. In my previous video, I said that I have conflicting feelings in regard to Su Yen, and this is why. She brags about herself with assertions of her principles, but she's willing to abandon those principles as soon as it becomes beneficial for her to do so. She condemns the monarchy when she herself is a matriarch, which is almost indistinguishable from a monarch. She condemns the monarchy, but she's all for the monarchy if it means spiting Kuvira. She's willing to chastise Lin for trying to control Korra, but she's all too happy to shout commands at Korra if it means making Kuvira lose. She's willing to pardon her chef and Varric for their crimes because their talents are useful to her. She's willing to pardon her son because... Well, he's her son. But she's not willing to pardon Kuvira because she has a grudge against her. The show dares to have a gray character, but you are so dead set on not giving it credit for anything that shows it had competent writing. Or, God forbid, you were just incapable of picking up on this element of her character and pinned it on the writers. We're introduced to Mako and Bolin's family and get a few scenes where Mako almost manages to pretend he's a person before abandoning that idea completely. Mako's not a person? How about how he gets protective of his father's scarf, fought tirelessly to establish himself as an officer that's worthy of being taken seriously, dedicated himself to solving the mystery behind the Southern Water Tribe Cultural Center bombings, a case he eventually solved, struggled with telling Korra the truth about their messy breakup, didn't want to go to the Earth Kingdom because he thought it'd be inappropriate to be around Korra and Asami, continues to care for Korra and Asami even after their messy love triangle drama, acts highly skeptical of Kai when he was initially recruited to be a member of the Air Nation. And that's just the stuff I can name off the top of my head. I'm not willing to do a complete analysis of Mako and his characterization just to debunk this one baseless, vapid argument. It's almost like ticking off a checklist of story ideas that they had to make a passing nod to. We get an entire arc with the airbending students and Tenzin teaching them to live like air nomads, and it almost feels like this is going somewhere, but it seemingly gets dropped after a minor event with Jinora and Kai, and we're right back to these four idiots. Hold up. In section 1 of your video, you were complaining about how the series neglected to take plot detours due to its serialized episode structure. Now you're making the exact opposite argument. Episodes like Original Airbenders was exactly what you wanted. An independent side story that develops characters. CONSISTENCY, damn it! I need consistency! Food! Water! CONSISTENCY! The season even ends like this. Korra's been beaten and poisoned so badly that she's in a wheelchair. And if you think we might finally get to see Korra experience real, tangible change to herself for the first time... <sighs> I've already been over this. It has been discussed at length how Korra is constantly evolving throughout all four seasons. It's so glaringly obvious, I don't even know what to say at this point. Does it have to be up in your face for you to see it? Does it have to be spelled out for you? Was it just too subtle for you despite the fact that several people, including myself, recognize the constant development of her character? How many times over this season, over these four seasons, has she been told that she's irrelevant? That the world yes. doesn't need her anymore? Yes. How much does she not, she doesn't even know what to do anymore. She's saying like, let me try diplomacy. The fighting hasn't worked. No, now I'm gonna have to fight. She doesn't know what to do. She's so confused. Yeah. And she's divorced herself from herself. And I feel like... If that makes any sense. <laughs> the finale of season three has perhaps one of the best examples of how much Korra has come to grips with the weight of her responsibilities. The hostage situation. At this point in the story, Zahir has captured the majority of the newly formed Air Nation and is demanding Korra in return. If this were taking place in season one, how do you think Korra would respond to the situation? She'd 
rush in there like a bull and try to take the airbenders herself. Hostage situation be damned. And that'd probably just get her a bunch of dead airbenders. But this isn't season one. Korra has grown up since then. She recognizes that hostage situations must be navigated delicately, and she only resorts to violence when she learns that Zahir did not hold his end of the deal. The next season opens three years later and Korra's already mobile again. The closest thing that Korra has to deal with is lingering post-traumatic stress disorder and poison in her body, but she manages to remove the poison after some training with Toph. Uh, yeah. Korra was in a mental state in which she couldn't get the mercury out of her body, and the mercury was part of what caused her disconnect with her avatar spirit. If the show wanted to give Korra an easy way out, Toph would have been able to completely cleanse her body in this scene. But Toph doesn't. This is something Korra has to do herself. Why would I want poison inside me? I don't know. Maybe so you have an excuse not to go back to being the avatar. If you don't get better, you can't do your job, so you don't have to worry about getting hurt again. Uh, what? That's ridiculous. Whatever. When you want it out, you can bend it out. I can't deal with all your issues for you. So she trains. She earns the ability to fix her problems. What did you want to happen? Did you want the poison to permanently stay in her body? Because then you just complain that she never works through her problems and whines about them. There's no winning with you, and that exemplifies the fact that your inherent bias against this show makes you unable to engage in any meaningful criticism of it. Korra works through her problems. The problem just got magicked out of her. Korra doesn't work through her problems. Instead of doing anything about it, Korra just sits around and complains. Korra gets help with her problems. She's handed everything on a silver platter. But there's still her PTSD, right? Well, no. Korra does deal with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder for two-thirds of the fourth season, but it, like everything else, gets magic out of her in the meditation scene. Here we are at the very end of this nearly seven minute long segment, and there's finally a criticism I can sorta agree with. I don't like how the symptoms of Korra's PTSD sorta disappeared after her confrontation with Zahir. Sure, it was a moment of catharsis for her, but PTSD doesn't go away just like that. I think some lingering hints of insecurity and fear should have been sprinkled throughout the season to show that a little bit of the damage is still there. Perhaps while Korra is experiencing another hallucination or a mild panic attack, Asami could just swerve on up and say, Hey girl, you look like you need some help. A situation like that would have been a great opportunity to hint at their budding romance, while staying behind that gals being pals line Bright couldn't go past. Trauma, traumatizing, trauma, 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 trauma. Korra spends most of season 4 unable to do her avatar duties because she's being constantly haunted by Zaire's attempt to kill her. This is actually a big deal. As much as Korra has endured far worse, this is something I failed to adequately address in part 1, so I'm going to do it here. Korra has not endured worse than this. The finale of season 3 did three major things. One, it literally almost killed Korra and the Avatar altogether. If Janora and the Air Nomads were even a few seconds late, Korra would have died along with the Avatar entity. It was by sheer luck that she lived through this fight. 2. It destroyed her sense of identity. This is when Korra realizes that she has not lived up to the expectations placed upon her as the Avatar. She has it in her head that the Avatar is no longer needed. If she's not the Avatar, or even a good one, then who is she? 3. It removed her physical agency, which exacerbates point 2. Season 3 left Korra handicapped for two and a half years. Compare that to the seasons that preceded this one. Season 1 had Korra lose her bending, but that was restored by Aang after it was hinted that she was contemplating suicide. Season 2 only left her with a small scratch on her cheek in terms of physical trauma. Losing her past lives was certainly emotionally traumatizing, but keep in mind that Season 3 left her with severe physical trauma and a freaking identity crisis. So while Season 2 left her with emotional trauma, Season 3 did the same and more on top of that. So Korra's response to Season 3 wasn't only justified, it was to be expected. If anything, it'd be weird if she weren't completely screwed up after everything that happened. Actually being affected by something for the first time in her life is at least an improvement. I've already explained how Korra is affected by the things that occur throughout the series. But instead of working through that trauma and dealing with it, 
please rewatch episodes 2, 3, and 4 of season 4. Korra spends six months alone in the Earth Kingdom soul searching. That's her dealing with and trying to work through her trauma. She then seeks guidance and wisdom from Toph, who helps her reach a mental state in which she's capable of expelling the poison from her body. That's her working through her trauma. Hell, confronting Zahir in the first place is her trying to work through her trauma as well. If Korra never actually worked through the trauma and dealt with it, season 4 would look a lot like this. Tenzin arrives at the Southern Water Tribe and is greeted by an excited Korra. Tenzin observes that she looks great despite being in very bad shape when he last saw her. Korra responds with, Yeah, I was kind of feeling bad for a little while, but then I woke up one morning and was over it. Her physical rehab sessions with Katara would have never happened. Her cutting off communication with her friends and family for six months to wander around the Earth Kingdom would have never happened. The segments with Toph would have never happened. Her going to see Zahir at all would have never happened. That is what this character arc would have looked like if she never worked through her trauma or dealt with it. Korra manages to almost completely erase it by meditating into the spirit world and talking to Rava. I'm not entirely certain how this is supposed to help her, but this is the legend of Korra, so randomly shrugging off life-changing events is to be expected at this point. There are three components to the trauma Season 3 left her with. One, the physical trauma, that is, her handicap status and the remainder of the poison Su Yen wasn't able to bend out of her. Two, the emotional trauma, that is, her identity crisis. Three, the psychological trauma, that is, the PTSD she carries around after being tortured, made helplessly weak, and seconds away from death. With help from Katara and Toph, Korra worked through the first trauma, the physical trauma. Good job! Reuniting with Rava and reconnecting with her avatar spirit helped her overcome her second trauma, that is, the identity crisis. Cool. Now, the third trauma, the psychological trauma. PTSD is harder to deal with than the other two issues, unlike removing poison or coming to terms with one's identity. PTSD can't be reasoned with, nor does it have a clear-cut solution. It invokes a primal, survivalistic instinct we've carried over from evolution. While it was commendable for Korra to face the source of her fear, it was unrealistic for her PTSD to go away after this confrontation. Consciously, she's no longer afraid of Zahir after this scene, but realistic PTSD wouldn't care. There are 75-year-old Vietnam veterans that haven't seen combat in 50 or 60 years. They've been safe at home watching football every day. Doesn't matter. They still get flashbacks and terrible nightmares. That's just how PTSD works. Thus, my problem with the aftermath of this scene comes down to an unrealistic resolution of PTSD. A way to fix this? Throw in a scene every now and then that shows Korra still deals with flashbacks or nightmares. Maybe during this scene, she briefly locks up in fear and almost gets hurt because of it. This problem has a relatively easy solution, so my grievances with this mistake are more of a nitpick than anything. But the key problem here is that Korra can't enter the spirit world and needs someone to guide her there. So who does she get as a spirit guide? Tenzin? Tenzin has been established to have poor spiritual connections. He couldn't lead Korra into the spirit world in season 2. What makes you think he can now? Kaya? In season 2, Kaya doesn't step up to the plate to be Korra's spiritual guide, even after Tenzin confesses that he's never been to the spirit world. She didn't have the confidence to be a spiritual guide, which is why she gave the job to someone else. Jinora? Because she's stuck in the, the thing in the, the spirit world. Were you paying any attention? Nope. That's right, Korra's being led into the spirit world by the very person who put her in this position in the first place and being told to trust him. Let's keep in mind that Korra didn't visit Zahir with the explicit intent to ask him for spiritual guidance. She visited him with the intent to overcome the mental barriers that wouldn't allow her to enter the spirit world. That way she could fix the problem herself. Zahir just so happened to offer his help during this visit because they now have a common enemy. Well, I can't stop her unless I get over this block. I think I can help. Let me lead you into the spirit world. No way. I can't trust you. Maybe not. But if you had any other options, you wouldn't be here now, would you? We may have been enemies once, but for now, our interests align. Which is like trying to sue the Vietnam War veteran by showing him your firecracker collection. This is an awful analogy to the situation. A better analogy would be the following. A Vietnam veteran has PTSD over the time he almost got killed by a Vietnamese soldier. One day, years later, the veteran and the Vietnamese soldier are put in a situation where they have a common enemy. They realize their opposition to one another during the Vietnam War was not personal, and they sought to kill one another over their ideological differences. Having come to terms with this, the two then work together to overcome a mutual threat. 
and Zaire peppers this with all sorts of crap about how Korra's just deflecting and blaming him for her own problems, and Jesus fucking Christ. I can just hear the writer standing behind the camera going, ooh, our direct metaphor for someone's abuser is helping Korra get over the metaphorical abuse. There's a key detail that unravels the way you're attempting to paint this scene. Zaheer was not Korra's abuser. Zaheer and Korra were, and technically still are, enemies, but their opposition to one another was not personal, it was political. Zaheer is not evil, nor were his long-term intentions malicious. Like Amon and Kuvira, his intention was to make things better for everyone, but he let his ends justify his egregious means. He believed that ending the Avatar line was something that had to be done for the greater good, a necessary evil. Unlike an abuser, he didn't hurt Korra for his benefit, nor for his enjoyment. Korra realizes this about Zaheer. She also realizes that she and Zaheer have a common enemy now, and she takes the calculated risk to trust his help. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, is the mentality that's going on in this scene. Not, trust one's abuser. We're so edgy! I don't think you know what edgy means. And considering how the rest of the series reeks of someone being insecure at how much The Last Airbender was a children's show at heart, I'm wondering how many of these awful decisions like this were made with that same mindset. This, for me, is the defining moment of The Legend of Korra. It's the most telling portion about the priorities in writing and the most straightforward expression of all of its problems. So, you completely misread this scene and ascribed an uncharitable interpretation of its message. It can't be because you're wrong about the point of this scene. No, no, no. The problem is with the writers. So then you plunge into this wild, speculatory rant that your misinterpretation is because of Bright's desire to make the show edgy and grown up because The Last Airbender was too kitty. You assert all of this without a scrap of evidence. None at all. Just pure speculation. In reality, this scene was fine, and it had nothing to do with the writers thinking they had to make the show more mature than The Last Airbender. All that happened here was you completely missed the message this scene was trying to convey. A compelling character idea is erased. It was not erased. Korra worked and overcame all her problems through the sweat of her own brow. The only part of this arc that was handled poorly was the resolution of her PTSD, and even that is a nitpick. And the implications of that erasure are less valuable than the idea being erased, all done in the name of having the villain kind of have a point. Because that sounds smart to somebody who's incapable of thinking about this for longer than half a second. The Legend of Korra is the show where the creators try really hard to convince you that they're very grown up and smart, and it's the show where they succeed in convincing you that they're neither of those things. Nice speculation. Now where's your evidence that this came about as a result of someone being insecure that Avatar was a kid's show? If Reich wanted to get out of the animation age ghetto you appeal to later in your video, do you seriously think they'd let their show be aired on Nickelodeon? A kid's channel that is so restrictive of its content they would only allow them to show two girls holding hands? If they were obsessed with making the show mature, this would be a damn bloody show. If they were obsessed with making the show mature, characters would probably smoke and drink. If they were so obsessed with making the show mature, characters would probably be screaming SHIT during fight scenes. If they were so obsessed with making this show mature, I absolutely, positively, undoubtedly, 100% guarantee there'd be a scene with Mako and Korra waking up in the morning after- Fuck! That got out of hand. See you in part four!